Answering some questions very quickly, and then we're going to get into the manual, as I said, should be in chapter one here before the end of the night. <laughs> so, now, it says, the question is, do you need to get the permission of the sick person or family members to pray for them and see results? No. No, you do not. Now, <clears throat> remember, Revelation has been progressive, and I highly respect the people that have gone before and all they did and how they kind of plowed the ground and made it available for us to walk in it easier. However, having said that, a lot of things that were said early on were wrong, right? And there, I hate to even say it this way, but it's like there were degrees of truth, okay? Pure truth is Bible, simple as that. Now, <clears throat> there were teachings out there that before you could pray for a child, you had to get the parents' permission because they had the authority over the child and all that. Okay. Now, remember this. Whenever you, first off, it is right that you obey God even if you have to disobey man to do it. Okay? Now, <clears throat> because of that, and here's where a lot of people misunderstand some things about what we teach or how we teach it. What I'm teaching is that I believe that you read the Bible exactly what it says. I mean, literally what it says without reading stuff into it or out of it. So you just read what it says and then do what it says. Okay? Well, just, I know people say, well, yeah, that's what I do. I, I know, but many times that's not what happens. And many times you read it through either denominational eyeglasses <clears throat> or, as I tell everybody, we have, basically, we have theology based on failure. Somebody prays for somebody, they don't get results, and then we turn around and say, well, it must not be God's will because of this, because I prayed and it didn't happen, so it must not be God's will. Your failure does not dictate God's will. Right? When Jesus brought, or whenever the, the man brought his son to Jesus, first he brought him to Jesus' disciples. They tried to cast the devil out. They couldn't. At that point, we would say, must not be God's will. We tried, couldn't get it done. But Jesus said, bring the boy to him. He did, and he delivered the boy. So that proves that the disciples' failure was not God's will because Jesus did God's will, right? Now, <clears throat> and then Jesus got on to the disciples and scolded them because of their unbelief, all right? So he didn't say, well, don't worry about it, boys. You tried, and... It wasn't God's time, you know. Five minutes ago, it wasn't God's time, but it was meant for me to do this and not for you to do that. He didn't say any of that kind of garbage that we toss around today, right? Which is always an excuse for somebody not having the power to set somebody free, okay? That's where these excuses come from. <clears throat> now, it's very simple. People say, well, don't you have to get the person's permission because if they want that devil, can't they keep it? No, you don't need permission. And number two, just because they want that devil doesn't mean they can keep it. Now, here's the difference. <clears throat> People say, well, you're overriding their will. No, I'm not. I'm overriding the devil's will. You understand? I'm not overriding that person's will. First off, you don't know what that person's will is. And you say, well, but what if I ask them and they tell me no? Okay, first you don't know if you're even talking to that person or to a lying spirit. That lying spirit could say, no, I want to stay bound, I want to stay sick, or whatever it is, and you wouldn't know it. So, but here's the beauty of it. Jesus gave us authority through his name, all right? You understand what I mean by that? It's his authority, like I said before, but he told us to cast out devils and to heal the sick. Now, if he said cast out devils, he didn't say, and like I said earlier, don't put qualifications where Jesus didn't. He said, heal the sick, cast out devils. Now, so that means you can cast out a devil even if the person wants it. Now, if they do want it, you still have authority. You don't have authority over the person. You do have authority over the devil. You can tell the devil to go, and if that person wants it back, they can go get it back. You understand? And they will be seven times happier. 
right, if they want it back, right? Now, see, the fact that Jesus used that example proves that the devil was cast out of somebody that didn't want to follow God. They wanted the devil back. Because it said that devil was cast out, walked in the dry place, looking for rest. And finding none, goes back to the house he came out of and found it swept and garnished but not filled. And so he brought seven more worse than himself in. Right? So that proves that is the exact scenario that we're in. The exact scenario. So you have a right to cast out any devil and to heal any sickness. Now, what you don't have a right to do, or let me say it this way. We can get you well, we just can't keep you well. See, we have the right to set any person free. But now the only safe place for the person to be after they're free is to get discipled and walk in the truth. Right? You notice Jesus didn't tell you to go save people. Why? Because you have no control over whether they get saved or not. He said for you to go and make disciples. But he said go and preach the gospel. And it's funny because he said preach the gospel. Why? Because that has to do with salvation. Salvation has to do with a choice. But he said heal the sick. He didn't say pray for the sick. He didn't say talk to the sick about getting healed. Right? He said you preach the gospel. Why? Because they have to make a choice whether to accept it or not and get saved. But he didn't say, or what he did say was, heal the sick, which meant that if they're sick, you have the right to set them free. It has nothing to do with their choice. You get that? Why? Because you have authority through Jesus, over all sickness and over all devils. Amen. So your authority is not over the person, it's over the devil. So you exercising your authority over the devil has nothing to do with you exercising authority over the person. Right? Now, funny thing is, we can say, <clears throat> if I came in and they said, well, what'd you do today? I said, man, I was out preaching the gospel. People would say, great, that's good. That's, you should do that. You wouldn't have any problem with it. If I come in, I say, I've been out healing the sick. People go, well, what you mean is God was using you to heal the sick. But do do you see the difference? He didn't say go out and try. or He didn't say go out and, you know, do these things or whatever. And he made it very clear, you go heal the sick. And when they didn't do it, he got on to them. Right? It's only in our vocabulary that we're worried about these things. And as long as we're babies, then we're going to be more worried about the semantics than we are the results. See? He, what would I say if we say, well, I've been out casting out devils? You wouldn't have a problem with that. You'd say, yeah, we cast out devils. Yeah, that's what we do. Right? But say, say you heal the sick. It's amazing. Immediately. Well, you can't heal the sick. Then what are you doing in my line? Right? I mean, come on, let's just think about it. Well, man has something to do with it. Something, right? Now, we know it's God that heals. We know that humans can't heal. But we have something to do with it. But our problem is we're so concerned about how we say it that I end up spending more time giving qualifications about what I mean than actually teaching what you need to get the results. Because we're so worried about somebody taking it wrong. Right? Now... In saying all that, there's a couple of things here real quick. One was, it says, what does the Bible say about praying for healing and possessing the land? In general, or specifically, talking about like the slaughter of the aboriginals in the past. Okay, good question. Now, I know there's a lot of stuff out of there about reclaiming the land and doing that kind of stuff. Now, I can tell you, I don't get involved in any of it. Number one, I hadn't killed any aboriginals. (laughs) Right? If anything, my ancestors were the ones getting killed. I'm part Native American Indian. And so, you know, it was my people that were running around. When I say my people, but see, here's the problem. We have to realize, number one, I had nothing to do with that either way. And the Bible says very clearly, hereafter we know no man after the flesh. Do you you get that? If I don't, it says we we don't even know Jesus after the flesh. We know him by how he is now. 
well, if I don't know any man after the flesh, then I can't know you based on your color. I can't know you based on your ethnic origin or background or anything else. All I can know you is by the Spirit. That means there's only two families. You're either my brother, my sister, or you're not. Right? And everybody that says, see, I hardly ever call somebody brother. Why? Because I don't know you. Right? And, I, and so you may be, you may not be. I don't know. And so I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I may call your brother or sister or whatever, but I'm just saying that a long time ago, God specifically spoke to me and said, everybody that calls you brother ain't your brother. Well, why? Because you're either in the family or you're not in the family. Now, if I hang around you long enough, I'll probably know. Why? Not based on what you tell me, but based on what I see you do, how you act, what I sense by the Spirit, how I see whether you love God and love your fellow man. That'll tell me who you are, right? Not just by your words. And so <clears throat> I don't, I know there's people that go out and do these things, but honestly, I've never wasted my time on it, mainly because I do not see anywhere in the Bible where Jesus said to do that. He said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, preach the gospel. That's what I do, right? Now, I, and now do I believe that we are to possess the land? Yeah, but the way you possess the land is you make disciples and you turn them from darkness to light. Right? And when you do that, you change a city. You don't change a city by walking around and, you know, prophesying things. Understand what I mean by that? If that's all you do. At some point, if you're going to change a city, to change a city, you must change people. God does not care about buildings. Right? Jesus did not come to die for a building. He came to die for people. So if you're going to change a city, you're not changing buildings, you're changing people. So the heart of it is to go after people. So now, personally, I know there's situations, different things where people did certain things, but <clears throat> for the most part, there's not a lot now, especially in the New Testament, about you repenting for other people. Right? So if you didn't do it, I wouldn't spend a lot of time worrying about it. See, here's the thing. For whatever reason, well, I know the reason. It's pretty simple. <clears throat> People would rather do things that make them look good than do things that are effective. And they would rather, they would rather be thought of as, a, as an expert than to just be thought of as normal. You see, God called us to teach the Bible, to take heed to our doctrine, to teach people, to disciple people. And because we want to be so much like the world, we would rather go out and get a degree in counseling. You understand? There is no ministry of counseling in the Bible. The Holy Spirit is a counselor. Do you understand? Now, I'm saying that because we have built that in basically what we have is we have a subculture in Christianity where we are just like the world. And usually the people that become counselors in the church are people that don't have the requirements to be a counselor in the world. But they come into church and the church needs help so bad, usually, they let anybody come in and do anything. And so you can come in and be an expert, and because of that, a bunch of garbage is coming to the church to where these experts want to be seen as experts, and so they can tell you every detail about every problem, where it comes from, the spiritual roots, and all these things, and it'll take them five years to get you free because the Bible never said to go counsel out devils. It says to cast them out, right? And one good, strong, come out is better than six months of counseling. Amen? Do you understand that? <clears throat> Amen. Now, <clears throat> now I'm going to be very blunt, as if I haven't been already, okay? <clears throat> but the problem is that we have in the church... The reason people do that 
is because they don't have the power to set people free. So they have to get you to work your problems out rather than cast your problems out. You understand? So what goes on in the church, what is going on in the church is no different than what goes on in the world. And that's not right. If we are the church of Jesus Christ, if we are a divine, supernatural organism, then there has to be that in us that is separate and different from that which is in the world. And if the world can do what you're doing, then what you're doing is not divine. Do you understand? We should be able to do things that the world cannot do. That's what makes it a sign. That's why we were talking earlier, and, and you know, one of the things now, if you want a healing ministry, all you need is a, a degree in exercise physiology and nutrition. And nutrition has become a God. The Bible says, people, uh, talks about people whose belly was their God. And we always think that means people who are gluttonous. Well, you can, your God, your belly can be just as much a God if all you ever talk about and think about is what food you can eat and what food you can't eat. And this food's bad for you and that food's good for you. And oh, if you have this you know, chemical imbalance, you can eat this food and that'll fix that. And oh, this, this disease, well, if you just change your eating habits, you can, you, then that'll fix that. Okay, anybody can do that. That ain't God. You understand? I'm not saying it doesn't work. But the reason you have to go to that is because you don't have the power to set a person free. So you tell them, Jesus never told a person something they had to do to get free. You understand? He, he affected the cure, and then it was a sign to the people of the power of God. So this idea that, that you know, we've got to do all these certain things, or gotta, all we've done is bring the world in. We brought the world into the church, and, and the bad part is they're usually better at it than we are. And then it makes us look bad. Right? Because we're, you can't fight against the devil on the devil's ground. You can't do it. You've got to stay in the spirit. If the devil ever gets you out of the spirit and gets you into the natural, he will tear you up. So you have to stay in the spirit and make him come into the spirit to come after you. And when he does that, you will win every time. You understand? So the key is staying in the spirit. And that, you say, well, how do I stay in the Spirit? You do the Word. You do what it says, when it says. You do it how it says to do it. And you don't try to figure all these other things out. Right? There are things you don't need to know. There, you get in this Word, and I guarantee you, you'll know more psychology than any other person. You know, average person I'm talking about. The reason I'm saying this is because, the, see, there's different, <clears throat> in James, it says that there are two wisdoms. There is a divine wisdom, a heavenly wisdom that comes down from above, and there is an earthly, devilish wisdom. That's the only two. So you are either practicing divine wisdom or devilish wisdom. Now, <clears throat> when Peter told Jesus, Jesus said, I'm going to go be crucified, and Peter said, nope, we're not going to let it happen. Jesus turned to him and said, get behind me, Satan. Now, when he said that, he also said why he called him Satan. He said, because you savor not the things of God, but of man. Now, you notice he didn't say because you savor the things of the devil. He said, You're, he said get behind me Satan, which means adversary. But he said, get behind me Satan. And he said, the reason you're Satan is because you're thinking like a man and not like God. You hear that? There's only two minds. There's God's and there's the devil's. You will either think with the mind of Christ or you'll think with the mind of the world. If you think with the mind of the world, you're thinking with the mind of the devil. Why? Because the whole earth lies in the power of the devil, basically. Do you get that? So there's not a neutral area. There, remember this. There can never be neutral. If there could be neutral, Jesus wouldn't have had to die. Right? Because we could have got neutral. But there's not a neutral. It's either God or the devil. Real simple. Now, once you realize that, <clears throat> now, so you have to, if you look at, 
Jesus was, he always said, look, if the tree is bad, you know, if the, if the fruit's bad, the tree's bad. If the tree's bad, the fruit will be bad. He said a good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. What? What's he saying? Look at the source, okay? If you want to go in and start looking at the sources of these things, <clears throat> you can't name anybody that, that helped originate psychiatry or psychology that was not either mentally ill himself, was not a drug addict, didn't have some type of major moral or immoral problem or fantasies about their sisters, their mother, or somebody. Right? Why? Because they were demon-possessed. Now, listen. A demon-possessed person doesn't know you if you're born of God. The natural mind cannot receive the things of the Spirit. They can't understand the things of God. Is that right? Well, if you're born of God, then they can't understand you. If they can understand you, they can't fix you. You understand that? Going to the world, for a Christian to go to the world to get help is a total waste of time and is only going to mess you up more. Why? Because they don't get you. They don't understand you. They, they, let me tell you, if the world understands you, you ain't born again. Jesus said, they don't understand me, they won't understand you. Is this right? I mean, at some point, we're just going to have to realize. You know, it's funny, I hear people say all the time, well, whatever God takes away from you when you get born again, he'll replace it with something better. That's not necessarily true. God never told you he'll replace everything you give up with something else. Not everything. Now, some things, if you give up for his sake and the gospel's sake, yeah, he will. But th there doesn't have to be an exact opposite of everything. Some things you just need to stop doing. You know? Well, I, I gave up my soap operas and you know, God's let me watch this program. No, you need to get in your Bible. <laughs> Quit watching anything. <laughs> Amen? You know? Well, why, why do I have all these problems? That's probably because you listen to 15 different preachers. And every one of them will tell you a different answer. Just get in the Bible. Do what it says. This stuff is simple. Anybody can understand the Bible if you'll take some time and just read it, right? And just let it, well, not just read it, but decide to do what you find. You know, and the, the more I, I, I go into this, the, the, the stronger it gets. Why? Because there has to be that in us that is different than the world. What good does it do to be just like the world and then tell the world, you need us and come in here, right? It, it doesn't do any good at all. They're looking for something, and we've got to be able to give it to them. So, now, <clears throat> here was, as the Word of God is our ultimate rule of faith and action, do various Bible translations affect it, and thus our effectiveness and power? Yeah. There are Bibles out there that I wouldn't use as a doorstop. Okay? Real simple. Um, honestly I have no problem reading the King James because I was raised on it and, and, and it's, it's not always the most accurate I mean overall it's, it's good all right? and there, it has the most tools that you can use with it that can find out what it goes into but, or what's in, in the original but as far as there, there are translations out there that take out the blood there, there are translations out there that take out all kinds of various things and put in different words um, you know, I, honestly, I stick with the King James. I do have a, one is called an expanded translation by Kenneth S. Wiest. Probably, it, it is the most accurate New Testament translation. It, it's very good, but you got, if you think the King James is hard to read, you got to read that thing, because one sentence in King James will become a paragraph, because it is expanded. I mean, it, but it's exactly what a first century Greek person would understand it to say. So it is good. It's, it's overall, and he, has, he actually has a four-volume set that it's one of the volumes, so it's good. But I don't use a lot of different uh, commentaries and things. I have a, on my laptop, I have a PC study Bible. I think it's version 5 that has several different translations. I don't use a lot of them, uh, but I do, and I don't use a lot of the commentaries. Every now and then I might open up one or two and see what they said or what this one said, but it is never... Um, I hardly ever use them as any type of authoritative source. Why? Because they were men. Right? They can make mistakes like anybody else. 
And so I always go back to the Bible and let the Bible translate itself. Okay? It's very simple. <clears throat> just keep it in context. Easiest way to find out what's being said is just read seven verses before and seven verses after. And if you read about 14 or 15 verses, you'll know the context. Right? A lot of wrong doctrine started because people pull out one verse out of the middle of something and don't talk about it in context. Keep it in context. So you don't have to get fancy. Right? Just stick with the simplicity of the gospel. It works. When you start getting fancy, <clears throat> you go back and even whenever I was fighting, uh, one of the things that you notice is that the best fighters were not the ones that had the biggest repertoire of weapons or tools or techniques. The best fighter was the one that had mastered just a couple of techniques. And where they really shone was that they could always get their opponent into a position where they could use one of those two or three best techniques. So, it's, it really, if you get down to it, this stuff is so simple. I mean, there is nothing that the name of Jesus can't beat. That's all you need. That's it, right there. I mean, if you could just believe that, then I wouldn't need to tell you anything else. Why? Because <clears throat> there is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. So that takes care of that, right? There is nothing that has a name, right, that does not have to bow its knee to the name of Jesus. If it's got a name, it's got a bow. Cancer's a name, it's got a bow, right? HIV is a name, it's got a bow, right? So it doesn't matter what it is. Even if you, do, well, the doctors can't diagnose it. Okay, you know what the name of that is? Spirit of infirmity. That's what it is. So it's still got a name. So you can call that thing out. Whatever it is, the name of Jesus will beat it. All you need is the name of Jesus and understand what that name does. That's what Peter said in Acts 3. And he gave you the, the secret. I mean, we're here studying about healing. So if you want to know the secret, it's real simple. Peter tells us. As a matter of fact, if you want to go to Acts chapter 3, we'll read it real quick. <coughs> Acts 3. <clears throat> okay, how many here, how many of you are born again? Okay, you're saved, right? Okay. <clears throat> Just making sure. Okay. Yeah, okay. It says mental illness is growing. I want to be used by God to heal people, but there's a real fear factor involved. What results have you seen in this area? Good question. Physical healings I have no problem with. Mental illness, another ball game. No, it's not. Nope. It's the same thing. Works the same way. Everything works the same way. <clears throat> now, the difference is, here's a, here's a problem. Mental illness has you psyched out. Okay? In the stare down before the fight, you blinked. That's all it is to it. It has you convinced that it's tougher than you. And the problem is, that, will, that is true if you stick your head out of Jesus to where you try to think you're doing it. But if you stay hid in Christ, then you are in him, and when you talk, it's coming out of Christ, and so all the devil hears is a voice coming out of Christ. I'm, I'm being a little, you know, <clears throat> I'm using some not hyperbole, but metaphors, okay? Something like that anyway. <clears throat> One of those things, <laughs> okay? So, the idea is that, okay, there, it's either all of God's power or it's none of his power. It either is or it ain't. If it is his power, then mental, Ill, mental illness is no different than anything else. Now, if you're trying to attack this thing in your own power, then yeah, you're right. Mental illness will beat you every time. Why? Because you have no power over it except through Jesus. Right? So the problem is you're looking at it through, the eyes, through your eyes and not through Jesus' eyes. You have to see it through him. All right? Once you see it through him, everything gets easier. And you don't look at it, big this, little that, big this. It's not like that. It is all, everything. See, you have to look at it from the eyes of a king. In the eyes of a king, everything is a subject. Okay? The word subject, see, we say, well, he's a subject of that kingdom. What the word subject goes back to the fact that they are subjected to that king. So you have to look at every situation through the eyes of a king that everything is subject to that name. Right? Yeah. Now, because of that, everything is also subject to change. You hear all these words subject over and over again, right? That's the key. So 
They're both the same. They work the same way. <clears throat> the difference is you probably just haven't seen any results there. Now, I can give you, we've seen uh, cerebral palsy. We've seen uh, Down syndrome. We've seen, what was the other one? Autism. We've seen, I mean, honestly, I don't know of anything that you could name that we have not seen beaten, right? Now, I'm not saying we've beaten it every time we've seen it because a lot of these things we grew into. But, and I'm trying to teach you some things so that you grow into them faster than I did and so that you start seeing them all the same so you get the same results. You will have some people, usually what you call a gift is a person who has their faith developed in a certain area, right? It's not a gift as we would think of a gift. It's just your faith is developed. You start praying for people with, you know, bad backs. They start getting healed pretty soon. Bad backs are nothing to you. Right? And then someone walks up and says they got a hurt ankle, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, well, let's, we'll, we'll try that. Why? Because you have high faith for backs and no faith for ankles. Right? So you can have faith in some areas and not faith in others. Right? No. So the idea is that you have to develop your faith in every area so that you can attack anything. Now, Acts 3 here. Yep, let's get there. <clears throat> So you're born again, right? I already asked you that, I know, but you're born again. I just want to make sure you didn't get lost in the last five minutes. We'll just make sure. Okay, Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now, Peter and John, before I even get started here, what I'm going to read to you in this chapter is going to destroy probably a good 60% of all traditions of man concerning healing. Right? So we'll just get it done in one chapter. Is that good? That'll work? That way I can send you home with something you can think about and hopefully you won't be able to sleep. Now, Hey, if I can't sleep, you don't need to. So <laughs> I keep waking up at one in the morning and three in the morning, and in about now is when I start going. Oh, okay, it's good. Oh, okay. <laughs> so now, verse one. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. So where were they going? Pray. To the temple to pray, right? So what does that mean? They weren't prayed up. They weren't prayed up. They were going to pray. So somebody caught them on the way to pray. So they didn't say, hey, wait, catch us on our way out. Right? Okay. <clears throat> so what does that mean? That means you don't, there's not a certain amount of prayer you've got to do before you can do something. Right? And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried. Now that would have been a hard case. Right? I mean, if somebody says, well, when was the last time you walked? Well, I walked two months ago, but it's just been two months. Okay, well, so when was the last time you walked? Well, I've never walked. Ooh, okay. <laughs> now, come on, what's the difference? Walking or not walking is still walking or not walking. Right? So you got you to get past this idea. The enemy tries to bluff you. He tries to convince you, oh, this is big, it's bad. Oh, it's good. You got to realize, you got to look at him and go, no, no, no. You want to see big and bad, you need to see my big brother and my father. That's big, right? You ain't nothing to that. Amen? Okay. All right. He says, A certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. So what was he asking for? Okay, what was that? Money, right. Alms, money. Now, notice here. They brought him daily and laid him at the gate of the temple. Right? Now, the first thing that scoffers or people with no power what they'll say is, well, now, he was laid there daily, so Jesus probably walked by him every day and didn't heal him. Okay? And used to, I could have understood that a little bit, but I want you to know, I've been in places where I have walked past people and the crowd been such that I couldn't have tell who, told who was there. I could have walked right past them, and they could have been there the whole time, and I'd have never seen them one because of the crowd of people <clears throat> walking with me that I could not have seen them. Now, it doesn't, it, it says they laid him there daily, but it doesn't say when they started. Right? See, it's funny. It's amazing because the critics, the people who object to healing, usually are people who claim to be Christian. Because unchristian people don't take the time to try to think this stuff out. Right? It's usually Christians that come up with all the, well, now why didn't Jesus heal them when they were there? Don't know. 
Don't care. Does it matter? Bottom line is the man got healed. Right? We're going to see that in just a minute. You say, well, well but so you mean there's a timing. Maybe, maybe God has a timing. Okay, show me that. If you can show me in here where it says this was God's timing, then I'll believe it. But if it doesn't say it, you can't say it. You understand? Not if you claim to be a Christian. You can't say it. Why? Because you can only say what the one you represent said. So if it's not in the book, you can't say it. See, that's like the one we're about to pull of Bethesda. People say, well, how come Jesus only healed one when there's a lot of people there? Well, how come you're trying to read that in there? It didn't say he only healed one. Matter of fact, that's in the book of John. And he said very clearly that the reason he wrote that, that he picked certain stories so that you would know that he was the Christ. He didn't tell every detail of every story. He told some stories and he gave some details and he left some details out because you can read all the synoptic gospels and hear different details from every story. People say, well, how come he left everybody else there sick? Who says he did? We don't know. All we know is that he gave a specific story about a man who could not get healed because he couldn't help himself. And Jesus went to the man who couldn't help himself and helped him anyway, which throws away the old saying, God helps those who help themselves. <clears throat> no, the gospel is God helps those who can't help themselves. Amen? Amen? So it just amazes me how Christians are the first ones to try to somehow badmouth God. I mean, come on, if his own friends are the ones that's working against him, that's rough, you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> now, he says, watch, he was asking an alms, so he wanted money. He didn't want healing. Right? He didn't ask for healing. He asked for money. Right? Probably to pay his doctor. No, I'm kidding. Anyway, okay. <laughs> now, he said, <clears throat> who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. Strike one for Peter. See, Peter was, poor Peter. He just didn't have the benefit of our good modern theology. He didn't have all of our seminary. All he had was three and a half years with Jesus. <clears throat> but it's funny because, I mean, come on. Is there anybody in here that knows, that doesn't know better, that whenever you're looking at a sick person, the, first, the last thing you want to say is, look at me. And right? We never say that. What do we say? Look to Jesus. <laughs> now, what do you think he's going to say? I'm looking, I don't see nothing. <laughs> right? So, now, now think about it. Why does a person need a representative? Because they're not there. <laughs> right? Come on. So, so if Jesus made his us his representative it's because he wasn't there so we're supposed to represent him right. not point people away to him I mean see yeah, these are just some basic things you know why there's no discipleship in the church because everybody's afraid to say follow me think about it that's what, Paul, that's what Paul said follow me as I follow Christ isn't that right but yet nobody wants to say that today because ooh, who, who, he's, he's calling disciples to himself he thinks he's something. He's, he's going off the deep end. He's, no, he said make disciples. Who, of who? Of Jesus? Well, yeah, of Jesus, but of Jesus through you. They got to follow you. Paul, Paul said, you've seen my manner of living. You've seen what we believe. You know what I preach to you. You've seen how I act. You've seen how I do things. That's what he told Timothy. But see, today we won't say that. Why? Because most people don't want to live a life worth imitating. And they sure don't want anybody scrutinizing them close enough to look at their life. But that's what we're called to do. We're called, the Bible says that we are supposed to be open books, read of all men. Right? We should have nothing to hide. Now, that doesn't mean we're perfect. It just means that if somebody finds something wrong with you, you go, yeah, I know. Isn't God awesome? <laughs> I'm telling you. You think that's something. I could tell you a lot of dirt on me, but I'm not going to. Say, so you think that's something. God still uses me, and I know more about me than you know about me. And I, I'm more amazed that God uses me than you are. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Now watch. He says, 
And Peter, <clears throat> fastening his eyes on him, said, Look on us. That's strike one. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Well, yeah, what was he expecting to receive? Money, right, not healing. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. Okay, well, that means he was Pentecostal. <laughs> right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Isn't that right? That's what he said. Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. Strike number two for Peter. Come on, you can't say that, Peter. You can't say, listen, what I got, I give you. You got to say something like, well, let's just pray and see what Jesus will do. <laughs> We're just going to hope and pray. No, you need to hope and pray. You need to believe and pray. Right? Now watch. He says, but such as I have, give I thee. Then he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And now watch this. He said that. And he didn't, he didn't, then he didn't just step back and go, okay, what's going to happen? It says, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. Now watch. Step one, in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. Step two, take him by the right hand, lift. Step three, lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. That's step four. Notice there was no strength until he lifted him. He didn't get healed until he lifted him up. See, maybe that's why a lot of times you don't see the healing you want to see. It's because you're not willing to step out and take the chance of, look, of looking like an idiot. Because the first thing you think is, well, what if it don't happen? You know, and then you say things like, well, what if it don't happen? I mean, I don't want to give God a black eye on this. And I don't want to hurt God's reputation. You're not worried about God's reputation. <laughs> Amen. You're worried about your reputation. When it don't happen, what are you going to do, right? How are you going to look? And all that means is you ain't dead yet, right? It means you got to die more. So, <clears throat> now, watch what he says. Took him by the right hand, immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch, which that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, what did he see? All the people running to him. He answered unto the people, You men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or Now watch. Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? Now stop right there. That right there destroys most healing teaching. Why do you look at us as though by our own power? In other words, he's saying, it's not because I'm an apostle. It's not because I'm anointed. It's not my own power. It's nothing about me. And it's not my own holiness. I didn't fast enough. Come on. I hadn't even prayed yet. Hadn't even been in the temple to pray for the hour of prayer. Had missed the hour of prayer. Right? So I hadn't prayed enough, hadn't fasted enough, hadn't done anything, any type of holiness of my own to deserve this. So he said, I hadn't done it with any of my own power, my own holiness, as though we made this man to walk. Watch. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus. When did he glorify him? Two times when he raised him from the dead, obviously, but also when this man got up. What? Whom you delivered up. Now, isn't that something? They come running to see something. He starts pointing the finger. <laughs> These guys are all excited. Hey, the lame man. He used to hear, you hear about Bill? He said he was lame, and now he's not. Let's go see what happened. They run over to him, and the first thing Peter says, You. You did it. You. You know, you know he did. He just started preaching to him whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One <laughs> and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. <laughs> Just have to throw that in there. <laughs> okay. no. And killed the Prince of Life. Who's that? I'm trying to think. Sounded like that guy on the underdog. Remember the old underdog cartoon? Yeah, underdog. Remember the underdog okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you killed the prince of life, whom God has raised from the dead, 
whereof we are witnesses. Now watch. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong. Now do you hear that? What, made, what healed this man? The name. And faith in the name. Isn't that right? Now, notice what he said. He said, it's not by our own power. Right? It isn't something that I have inherent in me. It's not by an anointing. It's not because I'm an apostle. Right? He said, and it's not by my own holiness. I didn't pray enough. I didn't fast enough. Didn't do enough good deeds. He said, but it was the name of Jesus and faith in that name that made that man to walk. Is that right? Now, if the person, and listen carefully, this is a good lesson to learn. If somebody does something and then they tell you how they did it, don't try to second guess them. They did it. Let them tell you how they did it and believe them. Amen? Don't try to, well, you know, that was it. No, let the person that did it tell you how they did it. Right? That's a good lesson. Amen? Now, notice what he says. It's the name of Jesus and faith in that name that made that man strong. Now, let me ask you again. How do you get saved? There is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. The name of Jesus. Isn't that right? And you must have faith in that name to get saved. Right? So it's the name and faith in the name that got you saved. Got you saved. Right? And he said it was the name and faith in that name that healed that man. Now, when you got saved, who exercised faith in the name? Was it you? It was you, right? You exercised faith in the name, and you got saved. Now, who exercised the name and faith in the name that got this man healed? Peter. Right? Now, if you can exercise the name and faith in the name for something as selfish as getting you saved... Surely, you can exercise the name and faith in the name to do something unselfish and heal a lame man. Amen? Come on. That's what this is all about. That's why I told you, all you need is the name and faith in the name. That's what it all comes back down to. And once you realize that, the more you study about the name and what's in the name, the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous runneth into it and are safe. Isn't that right? The name. Now, you ran into that name when you got saved. You're in the name. You have the name. The beauty of it is, not only do you have the name, but the Bible says that he named everything that is in heaven and earth after him. And that we are in that name. Not only do, are you in the name, but you have the name. You can use the name. And the name is yours. You are named after him. You understand? It's not just his name. It's your name. Why? Because you and he are one. Paul said, let me give you a mystery. It's like a husband and a wife. See, when the wife marries the husband, she gets to use his name. And it's no longer his name, now it's her name. Isn't that right? Now, she wasn't born with that name, but she's got that name. And she can use that name. Now, when you got born again, you came into him, and because of that, now... Just as the husband and wife are no longer two but one, when it's the same way that he that is joined to the Lord is not two now, but is one spirit with the Lord. So you're one. His name is your name. You can use that name at will because it's your right to use it because it's yours. Do you understand? You don't have to get permission to use it. It's your name. You can use it. And once you realize that, <clears throat> see... The church has never understood. We, we preach it all the time. We talk about it. But we always, it, it's sad because we always talk about it from an earthly perspective. From a natural mindset. And the church has never truly understood the union. And therefore the commun communion that we have with Jesus. We are one with him. Do you understand? And if you read everything he says, he says whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Where does the binding and loosing start? With you on the earth. See, one thing that you need to get a hold of is this. I've got to send you to break again here. <clears throat> when, he when, when a child of God speaks, heaven hears and agrees. 
and hell hears and obeys. That's who you are. Now, you have to remember, you are, number one, God's son. You say, but, but I'm a female. No, now see, right there, right there. You're trying to separate yourself from Christ. There is neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Neither Greek nor Jew. Amen? Neither bond nor free. Quit dividing what God has joined together. So you are in him. You are God's son in him. Do you understand? So you're God's son. Now, you are also the devil's master. And you are man's servant. Now, we'll look at this a little bit later on. I am God's son, and I am a son who serves. But I'm not God's servant. Because servants and sons are two different classes of being. A servant doesn't know what his master does. But a friend does, Jesus said. And the reason he called them friends at that point is because there weren't any other sons because he had not yet been crucified. So the closest thing he could call you is a friend. But I'm telling you, we're more than a friend now. Now we're family. Amen? So you are God's son, the devil's master, and man's servant. You serve your fellow man. Well, you can't serve your fellow man and get sickness off of him until you are the devil's master. Because you can't make the devil leave until you're his master. And you can't be the devil's master until you're God's son. So you are either one and all or none. You understand? You can't be man's servant until you're the devil's master. can't be the devil's master until you're God's son. But once you're God's son, you automatically become the devil's master, which allows you to serve mankind by getting sickness and disease off of them. Now, this whole seminar, we're going to talk about healing and stuff, obviously, and we're going to get into some details. But really what it comes down to is, this is about who you are in Christ. Why? Because Jesus didn't heal by a doctrine. Jesus never taught healing. Jesus healed because of who he was. Right? That's why you heal. Because of who you are. Not because of a doctrine. You know the doctrines. Come on. Is there anybody here that had never heard the doctrine of healing? Had never heard that healing is in the atonement? I mean, most of you, if you're here, you've studied. You've read books. You've got other things. You know the doctrine. Let me tell you, you the funny thing is, used to, when healing was a doctrine to me, I could teach it point one, point two, point three, so easy. And just go down the list. Boom, boom, boom. And it's strange because the more I lived it and the more I experienced it, the less doctrine it became and all of a sudden it's just who I am you understand I, whatever you give yourself to you become and so because I have been around healing and done it not just studied it see as long as you study it it'll be a doctrine once you start doing it it ceases to be a, just a doctrine and now it becomes a who you are I, I don't just know healing or I don't just understand the doctrine of healing I am healing you know, you know why? Because it's his life that's pouring out. You need healing, we can give it to you. You need deliverance, we can give it to you. You need salvation, we can give it to you. Why? Because it's who you are. You are heaven's conduit. You understand? The heavens can be brass. The heavens can be shut. They can be closed, or whatever you want to call them, to a sinner, not to you. Why? Number one, it wouldn't matter if they were. Think about this. If the gates of heaven were closed, it wouldn't matter because you're on the inside. You're seated with him in heavenly places. Who cares if the gates are shut? You understand? You're inside. Well, the idea is that, now, you may be sitting next to a person that's a sinner, not born again. They may be sick and dying, and they may have called out to God for years for healing or deliverance or anything else and not received anything. Why? Because the heavens are closed to them. Let's, let's just go with that for a minute. And if the heavens are closed to them, then that will be the way it is. But it's not closed to you. And your job is thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So your job is to bring heaven to earth. Your job is to be the conduit of heaven to unsaved people. To people that can't help themselves. To people that don't know God. See, we still have this idea that God's mad at the sinner's. 
So we think, well, they deserve this and we're, and we're over here. No. That's the whole idea is that God is trying to get to show people his goodness so that it will draw them to repentance so that it will take them out of that position so they will come into the kingdom. But the way you do that is by showing how good the kingdom is. And you show the nature of people. The city rejected Jesus. And his disciples said, you want us to call fire down? We'll call fire down. We'll burn that city up. And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. Well, that's the problem in the church. We don't know what spirit we're of. Okay. Earthquake in Haiti. Oh, it's the wrath of God. <laughs> no. What makes you think that? Why, why would you automatically think that? You say, it's like when Katrina went through New Orleans. The first thing, has the wrath of God against New Orleans. Really, is that why Bourbon Street never shut down? <laughs> you know, is God getting old? He just missed Bourbon Street, you know? I mean, it's amazing. Whenever God destroyed cities in the Old Testament, you never heard about them again. They, they didn't, you know, FEMA didn't go down and reopen them. <clears throat> right? And, we get, okay, and let me ask this. Why did he just hit New Orleans? You know, why didn't he hit Las Vegas? Is his arm short that he can't reach inland? You know, he can only reach that. Well, I don't know. San Francisco's still standing. It's a coastal city. Right? I mean, we got all this, and we got preachers standing around. That's the wrath of God. I can show you real clear. Jesus said, the Father has put all judgment in the hands of the Son. The Father judges no man. That's what he said. He said, he put all the judgment in the hands of the Son. And he says, I don't judge you either. He, says, he said, there is one that will judge you in that day. He didn't say this day. He said that day. And he was pointing to the day of judgment, the final day, and he said, and the one that will judge you are the words that I've spoken to you. You understand? Well, well AIDS is a judgment of God against homosexuals. Mm, not as soon as a heterosexual caught it. <laughs> so, the, so the judgment of God is contagious. <laughs> you, you don't get near them because the judgment of God will jump off on you. <laughs> See? We've got to realize, God makes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. Amen? God is good. Right? It, it's amazing because when you start looking at this stuff, how it goes into it, because in Psalm 103, verse 10. Yeah. Psalm 103, verse 10. Yeah. He says, He hath not dealt with us after our iniquity. There you go. Well, you know the judgment of God's on because of this? No. He hath not dealt with us after our iniquity. You say, well, well then how is it? Where's all the sickness? And well, some of it's sowing and reaping. Some of it is flat out attacks. And some of it is what people call accidents. Now, we know that generally it's not an accident in that sense, but it means you didn't plant it, but doesn't mean the devil didn't plant it. Right? But generally that's how all sickness and disease comes. Either sowing and reaping, accidents, or attacks. Really? But it's not the judgment of God. If it's the judgment of God, you can't touch it. You can't do it. If, all sickness, and, if sickness and disease was the judgment of God, then Jesus was going against God's will by setting people free. And he healed people that was in sin. Right? So I mean, we could go on and on with this. And you say, what does it got to do with healing? Everything, because it goes back to the heart of this. You've got to realize who you are, who you represent, and once you realize that you're not fighting against God, then you can fight full on, all out. Amen?